Welcome, Dr. Epicure. And in this lecture, we're going to learn about hips. We're going to learn about skulls. We're going to learn about everybody's grandpa. We're going to learn about Mother Africa and super volcanic catastrophe. As we follow that outline right up above my head and learn about the African origins of our own species, Homo sapiens. Now, the story so far goes a little something like this. Homo erectus evolves in East and Southern Africa and then spreads out across the old world in the erectus radiation. Homo erectus goes to Europe, those guys become Neanderthals. Homo erectus goes to the islands of Indonesia, those guys uh, become hobbits. Homo erectus goes to East and South Asia, those guys become Denisovans, whatever a Denisovan is. But there are still Homo erectus in Africa, and the hard evolutionary pressures of the African savanna are still driving evolutionary anatomical change. And we know that that change will lead to modern Homo sapiens because we've got the fossils and we've got the DNA evidence to prove that it does. But first, we're going to talk about broken skulls. Because in 1997, famous physical anthropologist Tim White, UC Berkeley, recovered a number of fossilized skulls from north central Ethiopia. Now, the skulls date geologically to 160,000 years ago. This is very old. No other anatomical humans have been found that were that old. Now, the skull that's right up above should look quite familiar. It was a male skull that was recovered uh, from his site. And it should, should seem pretty familiar because except for the cracks and the big hole in the side, it's pretty much the exact same skull that you or I have. This is a Homo sapien skull. A brain that grew up and out, a reduced face, a small gracile mastoid. That is a Homo sapien skull. But from the rest of the bones, especially from the pelvic bones, it had these, these bones had a mix of archaic Homo erectus features and modern Homo sapiens features that clearly indicate that this is a transitional population. And from this mix of features, Tim White dubbed the species Homo sapiens edaltu. Now, the, it's the edaltu because it still has some of these older erectus features, but it's really the Homo sapiens part that's most important. And particularly important were the pelvises that he recovered back in 97. Now, there is the Homo sapiens edaltu pelvis. Is it right in the middle with the Homo erectus female pelvis on the left and the modern Homo sapiens pelvis uh, right up above me? And you can see that even though the edaltu pelvis still has a bit of robust erectus aspect to it, you know, that, that pelvis is 90, 95% identical to modern female pelvises thus confirming this is a transitional form where that transition was almost totally complete. These are some of the first Homo sapiens. After all, I mean, hips don't lie. And from that male skull, Tim White was able to build an artist's reconstruction of what some of these very early Homo sapiens would have looked like. And that was what the reconstruction produced. So I want you to look at a, an illustration of someone who is almost certainly your grandpa. He's my grandpa too. In fact, he's probably everybody's grandpa. Hi, grandpa. And it's this, the find in 97, along with this genetic evidence that we're going to talk about in a bit, this ended a long-standing debate within human evolution. The debate was between a sort of candelabra theory where, you know, Homo sapiens evolved across the old world as a whole, or an out of Africa theory where Homo sapiens evolved in Africa and then spread out. It ended, it completely ended that debate. We, as a species, Homo sapiens, we all come from Mother Africa. We came out of Africa at some point between 60 and 70,000 years ago. The origin point of modern humans, Homo sapiens, is in East Africa, probably somewhere in or around the Ethiopian plateau. And again, what is exactly driving these gracile features of modern Homo sapiens? And it probably is the environment. Again, Africa is hot. It is flat. It's going to emphasize mobility. And one of the things about hunter-gatherer societies in Africa is that they are all characterized by a very high degree of mobility. 
modern human populations can look at, you know, a dangerous river full of crocodiles or a pride of aggressive lions in an area and can kind of look at it and say, we need to be far away from this, you know, and then five or six days later, they're a hundred miles away from that danger area. Modern hunter-gatherer populations can move upwards of 15 to 20 miles a day. Just incredible degrees of mobility. And this is one of the things that's driving the modern human form. That's why we have long legs. That's why we have small, gracile bones. We are built to move. We are built as you know, long-distance walkers or even per, uh, long-distance joggers. And this idea that we come out of Africa, the, the Tim White's fossils from 97 were further supplemented by genetic evidence, particular genetic evidence from mitochondrial DNA. And you see from the map above, this is a map of mitochondrial DNA. And again, remember, you have different types of DNA. You have nuclear DNA that you get from both parents. And then you have mitochondrial DNA that you get entirely from your mother, which means that I get my mDNA from my mother and she got it from her mother and she got it for her mother all the way back. And they can trace how this mDNA has slowly changed over time. They can sample modern populations. They can track how, what the difference is and, at, and attach genetic clocks to that to see like how much it's changing and date when, when things occurred. And pretty much every single strain of mitochondrial DNA from all humans everywhere on earth, it all leads back to Africa, all right? And this occurred pretty much at the same time Tim White found those fossils. So, I mean, that was just a double whammy. We are from Africa. All Homo sapiens are Africans originally. And in fact, the DNA analysis seemed to identify a set of common traits in everyone's mDNA that must have come from a single individual. And this individual was theorized to have existed in Africa around 90,000 years ago. And she was given the nickname mitochondrial Eve. And the genetic evidence puts her in East Africa pretty much in the exact same place where Tim, Fo Tim White found those fossils in 97. We are all ultimately African, and we as a species came out of Africa, migrating to cover the entire world. This was in fact a second human radiation. You have the original erectus radiation, which covers the old world, and a second much larger radiation of Homo sapiens that covers not just the old world, but I mean, look at that map. The new world covers Australia, even to all of the distant islands of the Pacific. But this migration was a very slow affair. You know, as you can see, spread out across the Mediterranean basin. It spread out uh, to South Asia. It spread out eventually to Europe and the islands of Indonesia. By 30 to 50,000 years, all of Eurasia was inhabited. By 50,000 years ago, humans had crossed Indonesia to reach Australia. Around 15,000 years ago, Homo sapiens crossed the Bering Strait to enter the New World, North and South America. Polynesians uh, from the islands reached Hawaii by 300 BC. They reached New Zealand around AD 1200. They cover the globe. But there is a problem with dates that has confused the caveman. Now, the problem with dates is this. Homo sapiens edaltu, you know, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, they're in East and Southern Africa at 160,000 years ago. Mitochondrial Eve is hypothesized to exist around 90,000 years ago. But they don't leave Africa until about 50 or 60,000 years ago. Like, why wait? You know, it's not like these archaic human populations come up, you know, to Middle East and say, oh, you know, it's not time to cross into Asia yet. We have to wait another 30,000 years. Why the wait? What were they doing all of that time in Africa? Why did they wait until 50 or 60,000 years ago to leave? And again, you know, it's not like these are empty lands they're moving into. Uh, Eurasia seems inhabited uh, for most of this period by these other species of humans, by Denisovians, by Neanderthals, by hobbits. And, and these Denisovians don't seem, at least at this point, to have contributed anything to our genetic makeup. So it's probably not pseudo-extinction. And if modern sapiens are like so superior, then again, why the wait? Why the 100,000 year wait? before the large-scale migration out of Africa. Nobody really knows. 
Uh, but there is a really, really compelling theory. And it starts with a lake in Malaysia. And the lake is called Lake Toba. That is Lake Toba today. Lake Toba, it's a lake in Sumatra. It's in Southeast Asia. Now, the lake itself, here's uh, the lake as pictured on Google Earth. It's a big lake. It's uh, 100 kilometers long, 30 kilometers wide. That's uh, 62 miles long and 18 miles wide with freedom units. But the thing you have to understand about Lake Toba is that Lake Toba has a secret. It didn't start out as a lake. Lake Toba, that photograph you see on the upper left is actually the caldera for one of the largest super volcanoes on Earth. The opening of the volcano is 100 kilometers long. And about 60 to 70,000 years ago, this volcano popped off. It exploded. Now, this was one of the largest volcanic explosions in Earth's geological history. The entire thing exploded. It erupted for more than several years. The explosion itself possessed enough firepower of about 2,000 megatons. That's the equivalent to 130,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. It exploded enormously. It expelled 2,800 cubic kilometers of ash into the atmosphere. And again, if we convert this into imperial units, that's 670 cubic miles of volcanic debris. A massive explosion. A super volcanic mega colossal explosion. That's the geological term for it, mega colossal. Here's a map showing where they have found the depths of the volcanic tephra uh, from the Toba explosion. And the Lake Toba explosion was gigantic. It seems to have sterilized most of South Asia. It dropped over six meters of ash on all of what is now China, on all of what is now India. It would have triggered a catastrophic uh, crash, a volcanic winter. It probably dropped temperatures by 15 degrees worldwide, triggering a severe century-long ice age. The Lake Toba explosion dates to 60 to 70,000 years before present. In other words, the Toba explosion dates prior to the Sapiens migration out of Africa. And this leads to the Toba catastrophe theory. The idea that this mega colossal explosion, and yes, that is the technical geological term for it, that the mega colossal eruption of Lake Toba and the resulting uh, terrible volcanic winter would have extincted almost everything living in South and East Asia. It would have greatly diminished sapiens populations. In fact, there have been several arguments that have been made which argue that even all the way over in Africa, populations crashed, uh, populations of Homo sapiens crashed to less than 100,000 individuals. So after this severe thousand year ice age, then modern Homo sapiens recover in a way that the Denisovians didn't. And that is what fuels the migration out of Africa. That the migration of the Eurasian landmass occurred after Lake Toba essentially wiped the slate clean uh, for most of Asia. And allowed Homo sapiens this second human radiation across the earth. And of course, the Neanderthals wouldn't have been bothered by volcanic winter. They're built for winter. And the wind patterns would have actually moved this volcanic cloud to the west. And the hobbits are located to the east of this eruption. So even though they're pretty close to it, the cloud would have traveled around the earth before it reached Homo floriensis. But the Denisovians, oof, it either killed them all, um, or it simply reduced their populations to such small levels uh, that they were simply no match for the migrating Homo sapiens out of Africa. And that's where we are today, the dominant human species on the planet. For reasons that we don't understand, the Neanderthal numbers declined and they went extinct. For reasons we don't understand, the Homo floriensis populations declined and they went extinct, even though they outlived the Neanderthals. And then we spread across the planet and then began 
to specialize into our own ancestral subtypes. And there we go, the story of the modern humans. And now we know about where we come from, and what we're going to talk about next is how we die. And I will see you there. Thank you.